Kirktober begins with a bang. The Buccaneers choke one away in Atlanta. Injuries are piling up. Rasheed Rice goes to IR. The Locked On Podcast Network presents The Big Six in 60. The six biggest national sports stories from the local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Get the real story. Why it matters. What's next? Who wins the big game? And more. All in 60 minutes. The Big Six in 60 starts now with the biggest story in sports. You like that? Oh, yeah. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Kirk Tober kicking off Kirk Tober just right. 42 for 58 passing, 509 yards, four touchdowns, one interception. What we saw tonight from Kirk Cousins and his Falcons offense was the explosive offense that we were all hoping to see from Zach Robinson, from Kirk Cousins, from all of these weapons. Eight 20-plus yard plays in this game. They had 10 in their first four games. They had eight alone in this game. You got two from Kadero Hodge, of all people, including the game-winning 45-yard walk-off touchdown to get the Falcons the 36-30 to overtime win. Two from Darnell Mooney, one from Kyle Pitts, one from Drake London, one from uh, B. John Robinson, and one from Ray Ray McLeod. So they were able to spread the ball around to their playmakers. This is, again, what we wanted from this offense. It felt like they were close last week, right? They had a couple opportunities, some deep shots. I broke it down on the extended All-22 review for the Locked On Falcons insiders. Link in the description below if you want to join and, and check that stuff out. And it felt like, hey, man, if they can just start hitting some of these explosive plays, this offense is going to start clicking, even if it isn't perfect, even if it isn't the well-oiled machine. And they hit those in this game. And things are certainly looking up for this football team. Now, it wasn't perfect for the Falcons offense or the team. You know, it's going to be fun to go back and look through the film and see just kind of how razor thin some of these margins are. You know, some of these passes, these tight window throws that Kirk is fitting the ball in. Some of these passes where it's like, "Mm, I don't know what's going on. You know, was that a good throw? Was that a good decision? All that sort of stuff. That's going to be fun to do. You know, it's one of the things that the Falcons struggled with tonight that has gotten a lot of, you know, Oxygen that I was just kind of like, whatever, man, like, you know, penalties, right? Penalties really hurt the Falcons in this game. It felt like every time the Falcons got penalized, they got eight penalties. I think the most they've had this season, you know, it felt like every single one of those was at the wrong moment. And it was funny because like, to me, like I've seen a lot of people talk about penalties and it's like, yeah, they've had some, some, some tough penalties. Like the one last week that, you know, wiped out a touchdown and whatnot. But it was one of those things where, like, they were in the bottom third in the NFL in terms of, like, being the least penalized team in the league. So it's like, to me, I'm looking at that stat and I'm being like, yeah, penalties have been a problem, but they haven't been as big an issue as they are for other teams in the NFL. And in fact, you've gotten off relatively lightly, you know, basically being, I think, going into this night being the 11th least penalized team in the NFL uh, in terms of total penalties and yards. But tonight, it, it certainly reared its ugly head, sort of feeding that sort of narrative whatnot but the falcons were able to prove resilient and overcome those issues you know again so many times in this game it felt like they should have lost the game Um, you know it just was a back and forth uneven game just little details that just you know they didn't take advantage of every opportunity they had but then they did you know and so it was one of those crazy nights right where it just felt like a bad process, right? It was just like a bad process, but you got a great result, right? You know, you missed the field goal, you block a field goal, you have questionable clock management, all those various things, you know, you you, you miss a couple opportunities in the red zone and it was sort of the, the bad process, good results is kind of epitomized, right? By that quick slant they ran to Drake London with 12 seconds left. He catches it, gains 14 yards, gets tackled. They rush the line, they spike it with one second, like a fraction of a second that that game could have been costly and you would have been, we would have been sitting here eviscerating this coaching staff. This is the worst coach. You know, their clock management is terrible. All that stuff. We would have been going in on them off of one second, but Hey, guess what? This is their identity guys. They're, they're a chaotic team. And speaking of chaos, we got to talk about the Kirk cousins chaos meter. And of course, if you're unfamiliar with that, that is something that we have borrowed from Luke Braun, the host of the lockdown Vikings podcast. He has bequeathed, the Kirk Cousins chaos meter to us. 
And there are five different levels of Kirk Cousins, right? Level one is the lowest level. This is where Kirk is too conservative for his own good. Level two is, hey, Kirk's out there. He's managing the game effectively. Level three is peak Kirk Cousins, where he's being a game manager, but there's just a little bit of chaos in there to get him to that peak level of performance. Level four is like, nope, this is too much chaos. Too much chaos with Kirk Cousins, and bad things happen. That's what happened in week one against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then level five is like, this is so chaotic that it's, it might be time that we uh, dial up number nine, the, 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 the South Paul. Give me, give me the lefty uh, out there. But this game clearly was a Pete Kirk Cousins performance, a level three performance, because like you look at that touchdown throw he threw to Darnell Mooney, right? Where he kind of threw it in like, was it double, triple coverage or whatever the case may be. Like I get where Kirk was coming from, but like, Darnell Mooney, the contested catch guy, you know, like that's not the throw that I would make the Darnell Mooney. That's a Drake London throw. That's a Kyle Pitts throw. But Kirk was like, no, I got my guy, Darnell Mooney. I'm going to lay, layer it in there. And like I got I got some, some hits from the Locked on Falcons inside. It was like that was a level four Kirk Cousins chaos throw that had a good result. And so that's what we mean where it's just like you get the game manager, Kirk. He's wheeling and dealing. Just dial a little bit of that chaos in there. And it's like that's where you get the peak version of Kirk Cousins. So the Falcons identity is going to be this chaotic football team. Like they are the embodiment of the Kirk Cousins chaos meter where they're it's up and up and down, back and forth. It's not going to be clean. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play by play and much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. And you can place that bet on some early week five lines. Following a big win over the Saints, the Atlanta Falcons are one and a half point favorites over the Bucks this Sunday. The Texans host the Reeling Bills. They're favored by one and a half in Houston. If you aren't interested in good football, you could check out the over-under for Raiders Broncos, which is currently set at 36 and a half. And I think that's probably still too high. So what are you waiting for? That's Fandle.com to get started. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. The Buccaneers choke one away in Atlanta. That you are Locked On Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I thought towards the end of the game that I was going to be talking about Tavier Thomas blocking a young way coup field goal in this moment. Instead, it's going to be the most inopportune turnover that we have ever seen. So Bucky Irving on first and 10 from the Atlanta 32 gets through the defense inside the 25 yard line and the ball gets punched out by Jesse Bates and the Falcons take over with just under three minutes remaining. And I know what you're saying. You're probably going to say in the chat right now, James Levante David got an interception shortly after. Yes, that's hundred percent true. But the Bucks run game on that drive was clicking. Rashad gains eight. Baker gains five and a first down. Bucky gets six. Rashad gets a tough three yards and another first down. The Bucks were already in field goal range, and they were looking like they were going to get into the end zone and put this game away. That fumble changed the entire landscape of the momentum and the script for the rest of the night. And it, it completely took away the offense's ability to put the game away. In fairness, Levante's interception had the Bucs in field goal range, but then a holding call on Graham Barton, followed by a pass to Rashad for a loss of two yards, then conceding and just running the ball on third and 25 from the Atlanta 43, that only gained a yard. And... They weren't in field goal range. They opt to try to pin the Falcons deep. The punt goes into the end zone. It's a touchback, and the rest is history. My biggest problem with that series, though, 
was the blatantly missed face mask on the same play as Barton's hold. Don't get me wrong. It was definitely a hold by Graham Barton, and I am in no way blaming officiating for the Bucks losing this one. But a face mask there on that play is an offsetting penalty, and they're going to replay second and 13 from the 31. Even if they don't gain another yard, McLaughlin is going to make that field goal, and now the Falcons have to score a touchdown instead of kicking a field goal to send this one into overtime. Maybe they do score a touchdown. With the way the defense played, they probably do score a touchdown. So that's why it was bigger to me that Bucky fumbled on the previous drive because that Falcons defense looked like a deer in headlights and they were just giving up yards on the ground while that clock continued to move. The Bucs had plenty of opportunities to ice this one. On the screen to Rashad that went for a two-yard loss, Evans was as open as he has probably ever been in his Hall of Fame career. He would have had a walk-in touchdown. That would have ended the game. The offense left plays on the field, but the defense was the problem in this one. I'm going to talk more about them in a little bit. But this is one of those losses where you look back and you're thinking about missed opportunities. The Bucs were one play away from four and one. Instead, they're three and two. They're 0 and one in the division, and they have dropped to second in the NFC South behind the Atlanta Falcons. They have the Saints next week. Then they get the Ravens in prime time. Then they get the Falcons again. I said it earlier this week that the Bucs have to go two and one in these three divisional games. Now they absolutely have to win next week and when they host Atlanta two weeks after that. This was a huge game for the Bucs that they just could not put away and really couldn't afford to give away. They gave Atlanta chance after chance after chance. And if you give a division rival that many opportunities on their own home field, it's going to bite you in the butt at some point. And that's exactly what happened in this one. It was just, it was a gut punch for Buccaneers fans. When that Levante David interception happened, I tweeted out, or not tweeted out, but I texted out to the insiders. I said, who else but Levante David? This one will all but seal this game. There was still time on the clock. Atlanta still had their timeouts. So at that point, it was not over. And sure enough, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, the Buccaneers found a way to just completely implode and give this one to the Atlanta Falcons. And this could be the a, a galvanizing moment for an Atlanta team that has struggled this year. They still have not had a game decided by more than one possession this season, but this is back-to-back -back wins now for the Atlanta Falcons against division opponents. So now everyone is chasing Atlanta. They have to lose games within the division to allow the Bucs to start to catch up. It's going to be a big matchup in a couple of weeks when the Bucs can get that split with the Falcons. That is going to be pivotal, pivotal but it starts with the Saints game next week. If the Bucs lose to the Saints next week, it's going to be a very, very difficult road back to the top of the NFC South because that puts you at 500 on the season and 0-2 in the division. That means you have to run the table the rest of the way in that division in order to get yourself back to the top. This is a this division's a lot tougher than what people want to give it credit for because of the last couple of years and, and how average at best it has been. But this game in prime time on the road was a huge one that the Bucs just gave away. Going to jump into the chat real quick. Ben says, what was with Cohen's play calling at the end? It looked like Canales, total choke job. I'm not going to go that far. Um, I think once they got the holding penalty against Barton, it kind of forced Cohen's hand to try to do some other things. I didn't hate the screen pass to Rashad 
on the previous drive, the Bucs had picked up a solid chunk of yards on a very similar play. So I, I didn't hate that call. The blocking was bad on the screen pass. Um, and so it goes from what should have been probably a five or six yard pickup to a loss of two. If you pick up four, five, six yards on that play, you're in McLaughlin's field goal range, you're kicking it, and again, you're forcing the Falcons to have to get into the end zone rather than kicking a game-tying field goal at the end of regulation. We got Justin in the chat that says, terrible pass coverage. Absolutely, there's there's no doubt about it. Uh, I'll talk plenty about the pass coverage uh, a little bit. Uh, Demon Hunter says, I'm a little late, but I'm here, by the way. What about that blatant face mask? Demon Hunter, you are a little bit late because I just talked about the face mask. And, and again, I'll reiterate, it's that's an offsetting penalty. The Bucks are at second and 13, you know, getting a redo. Even if they don't gain a yard, they're kicking a field goal. But, you know, instead, they don't they don't call it. And, and maybe they kick the field goal. Maybe they have to force Atlanta to score a touchdown. With the way the defense played, Atlanta probably doesn't have a problem scoring a touchdown on uh, on the following drive. So <clears throat> a lot of problems. You are locked on Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part wow. I am at a loss right now. It's funny on this morning's show, I talked about how the first two games didn't really feel like the playoffs for me because the Mets jump out to that early lead in game one of this series. Game two, they have a lead. Everybody else is sweeping their wild card series, going the easy way. This Mets team, they need to travel the, the hard way, it seems like. They take the road that's a little more difficult, the road that's a little more stressful for fans. And I felt every single emotion of a playoff game tonight. Unbelievable what just happened. We all felt it. The season was over for a minute there. And it was devastating and you were just trying to have the faith and, and, and try to keep it up and, and believe in the team. But man, it got hard because the Mets just simply could not hit for most of this game. And Jose Quintana delivers an incredible, incredible performance uh, to keep the Mets in it. Six scoreless innings, as good as you can possibly imagine. You go to the bullpen and the decision was Jose Budo. If the Mets lose, we would I've talked about that too. We're blue in the face. Why did you go to Budo? Edwin Diaz ends up coming in that inning. Why not just go to Diaz? David Peterson was available. Why not go to David Peterson in that spot? And I could say, hey, sure, Mendoza made a mistake. Jose Budo, I didn't even have the time to look up the numbers, but I do know for a fact that coming off just one day of rest, he has not been as effective this year. So you could have played that game. That would have been the topic of the show today as I was getting ready to do a really sad podcast. But – it's not a sad podcast. The New York Mets are advanced to the NLDS. They will face off against the Phillies. And this is what I've been talking about on this show for a couple of days now. It has felt like these two teams were on a collision course. The Mets get their season on track right before the London series. They had a dramatic victory there. And you know the, the couple series that they played against the Phillies leading into the end of the year, that final week, so dramatic. The Mets beating Zach Wheeler. It felt like... We we're about to get robbed of a series that we all wanted to see. I think even non-Mets fans, non-Brewers fans wanted to see. But you're down to nothing. You have six outs left and you lose hope. And I got to tell you what, I'm wearing a shirt today. This is the lucky shirt. I wore this shirt when the Mets beat the Braves. I was wearing it that day. My wife got me this shirt. Okay, I didn't buy it for myself because it's going to seem like a kind of egotistical thing to say. Not all heroes wear capes. Some host podcasts. I'm not saying I'm the reason the Mets won this game. That's more of a personal thing with me and my wife and whatever. But here's what I'll say. As a fan, there's only so much you can do. And this is what I did. So I'm just going to put it out there. Pete Alonzo, okay, I, I did the math when the two home runs happened. I'm like, oh, Pete Alonzo's due seventh. And in my head, I'm like, all right, this game's going to come down to one of two things. It's either going to come down to Pete Alonzo coming through or Pete Alonzo doing what we were all expecting in that moment or a lot of us were expecting. I'm sure there's some of you that still had faith. But I finally got to a point when Pete Alonzo dropped the pop-up. So the first tweet that you'll see is the one on the bottom. I quote tweeted it. You just know this game is going to end with Pete, with a Pete Alonzo strikeout. Six outs to play with. He's due up seventh. Solo home run for, for Lindor. Alonzo strikes out with a slider in the other batter's box. That's a reverse jinx, people. I got a lot of hateful messages. 
I've done this all year. Sometimes you say what you don't want to happen so it doesn't happen and the good thing happens. So I say that then a couple minutes later, there's a pop-up that would have ended the inning when Edwin Diaz is pitching. And Pete Alonso just completely misses it. Brutal play. And you just look at him and you consider the bat, the bats that he's had. You think this guy is mentally weak. He's not going to get the job done. And that's when I tweet out out of pure emotion, have him blow a pop up first. He's mentally weak. And I hate to harp on this guy because I love him. But man, it's written all over his face. I hope I jinx him, but I think I lost my faith. I hope I jinx him and jinx him. I did Pete Alonzo. Okay comes through with the Mets with their back against the wall in the ninth inning. Francisco Lindor leads off. He gets on base, which secures an at-bat from Pete Alonso, assuming nobody hits into a double play. I was sitting there the whole inning after Lindor drew the walk. And by the way, he draws it on a check swing. And if that umpire called him out on the check swing, I would have lost my mind. But he didn't. Lindor's on first. Viento strikes out. At one point, he had a foul ball to the third base side that, that went foul. And I was like, thank God, because you know Vientos is slow. And a double play takes the bat out of Pete's hands. Brandon Nimmo gets a base hit. All year we've been talking about, particularly near the end, where I, I've been harping again and again. This team, at the end of the day, it comes down to Francisco Lindor, Brandon Nimmo, and Pete Alonso. Those are your guys. It has been those three guys that have been this era of Mets baseball, like it or not. And now they have a chance to continue this moving forward, if Pete Alonso strikes out in that spot, he's done. I'm sorry, he's not a man anymore because that's your lasting memory. But you know what? Pete Alonso, he delivers. He had a great at-bat against Devin Williams, and he gets a pitch that he can hit. He goes with it. And the emotion of Pete Alonso as he rounds first base, knowing that he finally did it. A year where Pete Alonso has been at the center of attention. And honestly, if you've listened to the show from the beginning, I really have talked about how I think that contract year has weighed on him. How once he gets his next deal, I think you'll see a better version of Pete Alonso. And how for most of this year, I've had faith in him. I literally lost faith in him right when he brought all the faith back and he had his moment. Chills, man. Chills. This team is unbelievable. And now you just start thinking, okay, maybe it's a team of destiny. This could be the team that wins the World Series. You never know when you get to October. And I think the great part about this is finally, after two weeks where it felt like every loss could be the end, you get into a longer series and you now have more time to play with. Because I honestly felt if the Mets played the Brewers in a five-game series, a seven-game series, I felt like they were the better team. Although throughout most of the game tonight, the Brewers show why they are a fantastic team. Their bullpen is great. And you play played a game that is more conducive to them, right? You played the bullpen game, but here's the difference. For the Mets, you get six out of Quintana. For the Brewers, they only went five out of Tobias Myers, and it's asking a lot out of all these different pitchers. And so finally the Mets break through on one of the best closures in baseball. We've now seen two victories between what happened on Monday. I, was that really, what, three days ago? That feels like two weeks ago. That the Mets beat the Braves that way. Now you have another victory that matches it where Pete Alonso, when you're down to your last breath, basically, two outs left in your season, it's Pete Alonso that does it. And I could not be more happy for the guy. I, we, we have all tried to will this for Pete all year. So many fans wanted to get behind Pete, wanted to, to cheer him on, embrace him. And it's gotten tough. It's been a really hard year to be a Pete Alonso fan. But what we've said is once it gets to October, it only takes one swing to ch change the narrative. And Pete Alonso stepped up in that moment, and he showed there is some clutch in him. The same clutch that was there when he was one of the best hitters with running in, runners in scoring position in 2022, helping lead the Mets to a 100-win season. That guy's been there, but he's been absent for a lot of this season. He hasn't had the clutch moment. And then you know what he does? When your back's against the wall, you need Pete Alonso if you're going to go for a run. He finally comes through and has the biggest hit of the entire season. Game at the Coliseum. Game time makes getting to the ballpark even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork 
out of buying tickets. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last minute seats. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And the Game Time Guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the free app, and new users can get $20 off their first purchase with code locked on. Terms apply. That's code locked on for $20 off your first purchase with Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, the lowest price guaranteed. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn. You are locked on red. Your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. All right, Jeff, they did it. Uh, we've talked about this uh, on a couple of shows last week and this week that uh, you wanted it to be Francona. I wasn't sure they would go that route. I didn't think Terry Francona would come out of retirement for the Cincinnati Red situation specifically, uh, but the lobbying, the background noise started to heat up over the last couple of days, and here we are. The Reds have pulled the trigger. Terry Francona coming back to the Queen City as the manager of our Cincinnati Reds. The Cincinnati Reds made the best possible hire. The Cincinnati Reds got the best possible guy. When have we been able to say that? I I, I don't, it's been a long time. Like you got to go back to like Griffey for that to be the case. Like th this is the absolute home run that we all hoped for. But quite frankly, I feel like if we said it, if we spoke it into existence, if we said, yes, this is what's going to happen. Even, even the most staunch of optimists, including myself, were looking around like, Ooh, I don't know, like this team is, is this team really going to do this? They did it. They signed him for three years. Terry Francona will be the manager of your Cincinnati Reds for the next three seasons, at least. And Steve, for me, this, this, the first and foremost thing with this, I, I start off with the fact that you're not getting Terry Francona without some insurances, uh, assurances. Like when they talked with him, with Nick, when Nick crawl had his conversations with him, Terry Francona, one of the first questions he's probably asking is, all right, so what's our budget here? What are we talking about? Who are we signing it? And if Nick crawl came back and said, well, you know, we're talking to Adam Duvall and we're talking to. Terry, Frank Ona would have got up and walked out of that door. Like he mm -hmm. has to have had some sort of conversation that, that says like, look, we are serious about this. We are making an investment in this organization. And I know that the news about Bally sports and that that's something that we will eventually talk about with how this affects the Cincinnati reds, but it's clear that it doesn't affect them enough to run Terry Francona out the door. And that is super encouraging because I don't think he comes here and they're just saying, yeah, we're going to run back this roster. And we think that all we need is you. You know, another thing that I think had to have been said, had to have been discussed and had to have been answered for Terry Francona is gone. I think is going to be the lineup by committee gone is going no, to it's be his. Uh, we're going to get in a room and everybody's going to have a say and, and we'll pull names out of a hat. That craps out the window. Terry Francona is yep. going to make this lineup. He is going to put the best team on the field that he thinks he can put on the field. Uh, he has a reputation to pr protect, and he has standards to maintain. And I am super excited about this, Jeff. I want to get to this also very, very quickly. Um, uh, I, I spent a lot of time talking to John Sadak today. Um, before this news broke, uh, we kicked around a, a lot of options, that full interview. Uh, we're going to save that for Monday. Now we're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of that, but at the time, the Reds didn't have a manager, and I asked John Sadak if he was going to be able to make the pick. Who would he pick? This is what he said. Terry Francona would be top of my list. Uh, the guy's won, and he's won in big markets and small markets. He's played for the Reds. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of cachet that comes with him. I, I, he would just scream home run to me in almost every way. There you go. And, and I, I, you know, and that's basically the same thing you were saying. Well, and, and to be honest with you, I was saying it because I'm like, okay, so many people are talking about this. Marty Brenneman's talking about this. And, and I had seen some other folks writing about this and stuff. And I'm like, they don't just talk, right? Like they don't just say things out into the ether without having 
a semblance of of some knowledge of what's going on here. Like Marty Brenneman's not going out there and saying, "Well, yeah, Juan Soto would be the best deal here," or you know, they're they're going to go trade for Brent Rooker or something like that. Like this is what it is. And we go from Jar Jar Bink Chris saying we go from Jar Jar Binks to Qui Gon Jin. I like that. Um, but I I, I just. I cannot emphasize enough all of the different things. And we're going to get into the multiple levels of goodness for this deal. But the, on the surface of this, Terry Francona, best possible hire that the Cincinnati Reds can make. And his resume, just in case you are not familiar with it, he has won two World Series with the Boston Red Sox. He broke the curse. He took the Cleveland Guardians, at the time the Cleveland Indians, to Game 7 of the 2016 World Series with the Chicago Cubs, that close to breaking their curse. He is a super successful postseason manager and oh by the way has a winning record for his entire career and has managed over 3,000 games I said I wanted experience this is the most experience with the best possible outcome that the Cincinnati Reds could have gotten this offseason I look they're not done there's lots that we still have to do but this is a massive step toward a a plus offseason yeah, you're talking about a manager now, Jeff, that has 10 years of big league experience. Check that box. That's something we both said Huge. that the manager needed to have. Here's the second part of it. He's right on the edge, right on the cusp of what I was talking about with the Reds needing to hire a manager that was of the next generation. While Terry Francona has an, an extensive managerial career that you just covered, uh, from 1997 to 2023, he's managed in the big leagues uh, or coached in the big leagues. He played in 1990. He was still a player in 1990. So he's of that that right age group where I think he he has been able to navigate and embrace the changes of baseball and and and, and will be able to still lean into the analytics and still use the information. But a 10-year big leaguer, he's going to be able to also use the eye test and rely on scouts and, and take into account what's happening right in front of him, recognize when a guy is on a hot streak and not set him down in the middle of it. <laughs> David Bell, are you freaking listening? You don't right. sit a guy down in the middle of a hot streak. Terry Francona checks most of the boxes. I mean, quite honestly, I didn't lean in on this at all when we had these conversations, Jeff, because I didn't think they could get him. I didn't think that they would be able to say the requisite things to keep him from walking out of the room. Uh, I didn't think that, uh, you know, you, you would get a guy who, who, who leaves because he wanted to rest and recover and, and work on his health. And I don't know where that is. I'm sure it's going to be addressed at the press conference when the Reds roll him out. They're going to talk about this and we'll get the answers about his health, where it was and where it's at right now. I'm not even going to speculate on that, but I didn't think the Reds could pull this off which is why I didn't lean into it. I thought it was going to be Barry Larkin if he wanted it. And if Barry Larkin didn't want it, it was going to be one of those other guys, the David Ross, the Schumachers, somebody in those lanes. Uh, this right. is big. This is a, this is a big swing by Nick Craw. And I think, you know, you and I have talked more off the air than on about how much pressure is going to be on Nick Craw in the 2025 baseball season to, to deliver a playoff team. And this to me says, Nick Crawl is going all in on delivering a playoff team. Uh, I think Santander's on the table. I think they're mm -hmm. going to go get a big, bad outfield bat now. I, I don't think that they hire Terry Francona, and Terry Francona signs that contract without the assurances that you mentioned just a few moments ago being on the table. And, and I think the Reds are going for it. And, and look, they still got to prove it, right? But this this is such a good sign that we're at least on the doorstep. We're, we're getting ready to open the door. The chance is there. And just one other thing, in case you were not like, sure. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't be like Terry Francona has had an amazing career as a manager, but consider this from 2004 to 2020. And there was just one year in there where he actually took a year off in between the Red Sox and Cleveland. He went from 2004 to 2020. All of them were winning seasons. There, there wasn't one where it was just like, oh, maybe all of them were winning seasons. He was in the playoffs so very many times. And, 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 and I just, I'm stunned, dude. Like he was on my list. He was at the top of my list because it's obvious that he should be at the top of my list. I am stunned that the Reds actually got this done.
Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. And you can place that bet on some early week five lines following a big win over the Saints. The Atlanta Falcons are one and a half point favorites over the Bucks this Sunday. The Texans host the reeling Bills. They're favored by one and a half in Houston. If you aren't interested in good football, you could check out the over-under for Raiders Broncos, which is currently set at 36 and a half. And I think that's probably still too high. So what are you waiting for? That's Fandle.com to get started. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Injuries are piling up. Rasheed Rice goes to IR. What From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs podcast. Uh, tough day. Just uh, as we've been talking about Rasheed Rice and like the uh, process of finding out what the injury actually is, a lot of optimism this week. Uh, Patrick Mahomes said something. Uh, Andy Reid said something. A little bit about when we get him back. Always knew he was going to miss some time, especially this first game. But now he goes to IR. It's a minimum of four. They get a chance to, to figure out what's going on and start the rehab process. I'm not really shocked, but I was hopeful they would wait just a little bit longer, given that they seem pretty apt to carry uh, an open slot or two. Uh, this, I won't say is a surprise, but it does actually give some breathing room to this, this player and this recovery that they're going to have to go through. Did it surprise you? I'm a little surprised at the timing. Uh, I figured that they were going to wait till Monday, but maybe there's some rules that we don't know about specifically playing on Monday night that, that would make it uh, a situation where they would have to do it now. Um, to me, it made more sense for them to wait because if you're going to find out on Monday what his prognosis is, although the reality is, is he's likely out through November at the very least anyway, so I guess in reality it probably really doesn't matter. Uh, but this to me was a little surprising today. Uh, although it is Friday, they kind of like to tend to, you know, do a news there. Sorry, I guess it's Thursday, but they'd like to do news dumps, uh, on Thursdays and Fridays. So not shocking. Uh, we did know he wasn't going to be playing this weekend and it's not shocking to me that they've put him out for the next four weeks, which also means he cannot play until the Broncos game, which if he's able to play in the Broncos game, would be fantastic and amazing. And I don't think anybody would have ever thought that after Sunday. So to me, it's all a blessing. and It's all positive news. Uh, it's still possible he's in, he ends up out for the season. Uh, but there was reports that he was in the locker room walking almost like normal in a full leg sleeve. Uh, so that's something to consider. And it sounds like he's going to get a lot more tests done on Monday. Once some of the more of the swelling goes down. Yeah, and you hope that that's the only reason. Uh, Swan sometimes takes it takes a bit to fall off, but the fact is, injuries are piling up. Now, your top two wide receiver options for the season are both out for the time being, certainly for the month of October. And then, what happens next? That's that's trying to avoid the injury bug. At this point, we've already had discussions uh, earlier in the week about uh, you know trade possibilities, those kind of things. Uh, October is where they have to get some of this done. Should they sustain any more injuries? I think that's going to be a necessity. I have to. And you don't have time to wait around. So let's hope, fingers crossed, that they can keep the rest of the wide receiver core healthy. Uh, and they're starting to get some guys back at other positions. Clyde Brazilaire activated Whoa. his window today. He's got 21 days to get back on the roster uh, as well. Yeah, and it's kind of a bad deal. You say that they have – you have to keep everybody else healthy and Hardman is limited in practice today with a knee injury. Uh, that's definitely not something that you want to hear at this point. Uh, Kareem Hunt was limited today with the knee injury. So that's, or sorry, shoulder injury. So that's something you're not looking forward to as well. This offense is really banged up and they need to get that figured out going forward. I agree with you. They're going to have to figure something out and it's more than likely going to have to be in October. Although the trade deadline, I don't believe is until November 5th. 
which is you know obviously uh, over a month away so they have some time uh there are a lot of different things that they're going to need to get figured out between now and then and wide receiver is definitely not a position that i was thinking that they were going to have to be trading for this season uh but obviously injuries have a way of changing how that goes so Hopefully they can get it figured out and you look at what the wide receiver core is going to have to do. You have to get more from uh, Xavier Worthy. He has to be able to do more than just the go routes. That's what his focus has been for the most part. And I get it because of the speed. You want to open up things deep, but he did show the ability to win on crossing routes. And I think that that could be a big staple of this offense over the next couple of weeks. Use him in that sense uh, and then really try to get Juju going. Uh, the, The one thing that I think you know, you look at and you look at how this played out last week against the Chargers. I guarantee you they had Rasheed Rice as a big part of their game plan. And then all of a sudden he's gone and it takes out your entire game plan for the week. In that situation, you have to be ready uh, and you're going to have to change things up. But now they actually have a entire week to game plan for using Juju more, maybe getting uh, Watson involved more. Maybe you get some of the tight ends involved more. Uh, they do have different guys that they could bring up, and they just brought Jody Fortson back last week. So I wonder if they maybe instead of going with a wide receiver, they go look at maybe another tight end for the this game. I, I think that's certainly a possibility. We're going to talk about all those options in the next segment. For now, on the injuries, getting Clyde back in what is a beat-up wide uh, running back room, I think adds to the mix. Obviously, with uh, Hunt having a, a good first day out, but obviously the shoulder is a, a nagging injury. Seen them have shoulder issues in the past as well. So you got to be careful there. Putting it together so that you have a full room is really what the goal is here. By getting one player back, especially if a couple of them are banged up, and obviously uh, need a little bit of work with with Carson Steele there uh, to work on the fumble issue. Does it feel like that running back room is is able to take up some of the slack that maybe you have to search your way through in the wide receiver room? You would hope so. The big question is, is Clyde ready to go? Uh, It sounds like he's running with the – uh, scout team right now uh, so we'll see whether or not he's going to be somebody that they can activate you know the the thing is is looking at this game the question becomes with Kareem Hunt being injured as well and being limited with a shoulder injury you have to wonder uh, is Carson Steele going to be that guy running back like you kind of mentioned and if he is then you're in a situation where it's completely different than what you were expecting to go into this game uh, because I would think that you know maybe one of the things you could do is you can maybe use Clyde in more of a receiver type role at least this week to get through it. If he wasn't, if it wasn't a situation where Kareem Hunt was down, now you have a situation where Clyde might have to be uh, one of those main running backs. Because I still don't think that they're going to be using Samaje Pirine in most of those situations. Game at the Coliseum. Game time makes getting to the ballpark even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last minute seats. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the free app and new users can get $20 off their first purchase with code locked on. Terms apply. That's code locked on for $20 off your first purchase with Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, the lowest price guaranteed. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn. We'll get you updated on wide receiver Malik Neighbors' status. You are locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Let's talk Malik Neighbors, ladies and gentlemen. So, Malik Neighbors, still in the concussion protocol, still in the early phases. Now, what does that mean? It means that he is not yet cleared to put on the red jersey and participate in non-contact activities. And, you know, you would have liked to have seen that happen today, Thursday, as I record this, because you figure, okay, you get through... um, the non-contact activities, you're a little further on in the protocol and you're on track maybe to have a chance to play on Sunday. 
Malik Neighbors isn't there yet. And we're running out of time because, look, the Giants have one more practice, all right, that being on Friday. Saturday, they're going to have, I believe, a brief walkthrough, and then they've got, what, a six-hour flight to Seattle? I hate to say it, ladies and gentlemen, but barring a, a miracle overnight, doesn't look good for Malik Neighbors playing this weekend. Now, Malik Neighbors, as I mentioned, has accounted for roughly 32% of the Giants' offense. And that's a big chunk to replace. And I don't know if you guys remember, my everydayers might remember this, but a few weeks ago, I did a show asking if the Giants were over relying on Malik Neighbors. And I said in that show, well, what happens if, you know, an opposing defense figures out how to take him out of the game? Or if, God forbid, he's injured, what do the Giants do? Well, guess what? Now they got to figure out what they're going to do. So, what is the backup plan? What can they do? if Malik Neighbors is indeed declared out. And we'll have a game status for him uh, tomorrow. Uh, my guess is I think he's going to be declared out. But if he practices tomorrow, he'll probably be um, listed as questionable. But my feeling is it's, he's going to be declared out. But anyway, so let's let's get into it. If Malik Neighbors does not play, I think obviously the, the, the option is to get J Jalen Hyatt more involved. Now, one of the reasons I think why Jalen Hyatt has not been as involved in the offense as maybe some people would like, Jalen Hyatt, he's a good young receiver. He's got speed. He's got the, the will, works hard. But when you look at the little intangibles, such as fighting for the ball, such as, you know, running sharp routes, they're just not there. And I get the feeling that the coaches are maybe a little bit more comfortable with Darius Slayton and where he's at with regards to those two elements, which is why you see Slayton playing more than Hyatt. If you remember back into the summer, Jalen Hyatt and Darius Slayton were basically competing for the same roster spot and Slayton won it. So Hyatt, obviously if, if Malik neighbors isn't able to go, he probably gets a few more uh, reps. But what I think the Giants do in terms of their game plan and what I would do if I were the Giants, considering that this, the uh, Seahawks defensive line is banged up, I might try to lean a little bit heavier into the run game. And that includes, believe it or not, design runs for Daniel Jones. I mean, look, I know last week against the Cowboys, the Giants couldn't run the ball. They just they just couldn't. I think they had, what, 26 yards on 24 carries, 1.1 average. But, you know, you've got to play to your opponent's weaknesses. And right now, I view that defensive line for the Seahawks, based on the injury situation, as a potential weakness. The Giants, you would think, their offensive line, which, the you know, the run blocking hasn't been great. But you know what? If I'm them, maybe pull a surprise out. Maybe throw in Evan Neal on as a sixth run blocker instead of having the, the tight ends the way they've been doing it. Now, you're probably saying, Evan Neal, what are you, crazy? But hear me out on this, folks. Evan Neal, believe it or not, is a really good run blocker. He really is. He's a good run blocker. Pass pro is his Achilles heel right now. And that's because I suspect he's still trying to get comfortable after you know having success on the left side, still working to get comfortable on the right side. And by the way, missing injury, you know, missing times due to injuries has not helped with expediting that process. So if I'm the Giants and I want to pull out a real, you know, surprise on Seattle, I put Evan Neal in there for run blocking situations, especially if we're going heavy. Because running with 12 and 13 personnel didn't get it done with the run game. So if Evan Neal is, is, you know, as good of a run blocker as his stats and film would indicate, why not mix it up and see if he can't help with some of that run blocking? He has a sixth offensive lineman. Hey, can it be any worse than what they've been doing? I don't think so. But anyway, getting back to my point now, I haven't really addressed the passing aspect of it if Malik Neighbors isn't in there. I 
get this. I've gotten this question quite a bit. Will the Giants elevate Isaiah Hodgins? I could see that being the possibility. I think a lot of it, though, is going to come down to what the Giants game plan is. In other words, if they're going to lean more heavily into the run, maybe they say, OK, you know what? Let's see what our cornerback situation is. Are we going to have Drew Phillips and Adoree Jackson back, or at least one of those guys back? Do we need to bring up a cornerback? And then the other thing, you know, do we need to decide between a kickoff returner versus, I don't know, uh, you know, versus another receiver? So I think in all likelihood, Isaiah Hodgins will get elevated, but I don't know necessarily that it's a slam dunk. So if they do, and, and remember, folks, Wandale Robinson has been limited all week with a heel injury, but I anticipate he's going to be fine. So you're going to probably see fewer deep shots. Not that the Giants have been hitting those deep shots, but fewer deep shots, a lot more short passes. What I'm concerned about, though, if the Giants take that that uh, plan of action, I'm concerned that uh, – they're going to, the, the Seahawks are going to sit on those routes. They have a very, very good defensive secondary, Seattle does. And I don't know, I am I just don't think that the Giants are going to, you know, I, I just don't see them trying a whole lot of deep shots. They just haven't been able to do that. And, you know, the other thing to take into consideration here, folks, with, the, with regards to the passing game, Lumen Field is really, really loud. I've been to Lumen Field a couple of times to cover games there. And even in the press box, you got to put earplugs in. It's that loud because you can hear and feel the vibration of the noise of the crowd through the press box, which is basically supposed to be soundproof. So if you're running the ball and you have maybe concerns about, I don't know, false starts in the crowd noise, which have been known to happen to opposing teams, maybe by running the ball, getting that run game going, maybe that's a way to counter it and loosen things up. So I'm curious to see what the game plan is, but that's how I would maybe look uh, to attack the Seahawks if Malik Neighbors doesn't play. And again, I don't think it looks good for his chances. I hope I'm wrong. Because they sure would miss him. The kid's dynamic. And look, you know, when he does come back, let's hope that he learns that, you know, sometimes it's okay to give up and live to see another down. Um, as opposed to fighting the way he does and putting himself at risk for those hard hits. Which was another concern that, you know, I think people had with him coming in.